Hi, my name is uh, Robert Shaw. I'm head of the Human Capacity Building Division in the ITU development sector. And uh, our main mission is to really uh, assist developing countries and adapt to a new environment and new information communication technologies. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Shaw, can you tell us first about your definition of capacity building and how you view the, the concept? Well, at the World Summit on the Information Society in 2003 and 2005, they, they made the right observation that uh, although we may be able to bring access mm -hmm. to uh, you know, the internet and broadband and these sorts of things, uh, you can bring these new technologies, but also that has to be coupled with uh, capacity building. People have to learn how to use the tools. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can sort of divide capacity building into two broad areas. Um, the first area you might call just general, building general ICT literacy. Mm -hmm. uh, people become aware of the internet, that they can use office automation tools, that they know how to use uh, internet browsers and so on. Mm -hmm. And that sort of goes up to various levels of, uh, uh, of sophistication. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the first level you might be just know how to use these tools. But at a, a later level, more advanced level, you know how to really integrate the use of these tools into your daily work and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of one category, building general ICT literacy. Mm -hmm. And I think that category will be seen more and more as just part of normal cognitive skills development, something that we all have to learn when we go through our education systems. Uh, the other area is that, uh, and it's an area that we focus on a lot, is building particular ICT skills, like uh, assisting governments uh, to how do they develop policy and regulation or enabling environment to advance the use of ICTs in our countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we might do quite esoteric subjects like uh, uh, a particular type of mobile technology or a particular type of broadband technology and so mm -hmm. on. So it's sort of these two broad areas. One is the general ICT literacy, mm -hmm. the other is the highly specialized skills that a lot of our membership asks for. Mm -hmm. So speaking of capacity building, which target audience or audiences do you usually intend to speak about when you speak about uh, the, the concept of uh, capacity building? Well, since the ITU is an intergovernmental organization with 191 mm -hmm. member states, of course, uh, who we pay attention to first is our, is our government members, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly the policy makers and regulators. And uh, so that sort of is kind of our key focus area. Is, mm -hmm. uh, with those specialized skills to, to assist our government members to really bring the benefits of ICTs to, to their citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we discuss capacity building, based on the work you did in ITU, what are the challenges to achieving capacity building in developing or developed countries? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, well one of the things we want to make sure is that the digital divide uh, mm -hmm. doesn't become a knowledge divide. I think it's very easy for us who have access to the internet and these, these great tools, we forget that that really opens up access to the world's knowledge resources. Mm. I mean, when we want to know about something in, you know, in developed countries, we just go to Wikipedia and yeah. we know right away. And we forget that uh, that knowledge is just not available because people don't have fundamental access. Mm. So in certain regions of the world where they have uh, uh, unstable power supplies or no uh, fiber optic connectivity, uh, with, with poor, uh, let's say, local knowledge of how to implement the, uh, how to have the internet or something like that, uh, these could be major challenges for bringing uh, IC, uh, mm -hmm. knowledge about ICTs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mentioned that you're particularly interested in the link or correlation between ICT and learning. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, well, it's 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 a very interesting time. You know, there's the old Chinese proverb, mm -hmm. "Making live in interesting times," and and. Uh, I often put a slide up for some of my presentations, and it's a picture of the first European university in mm -hmm. uh, Bologna. It's, a, it's actually a painting from the 14th century by an Italian painter, mm -hmm. and it shows you know, people like in medieval robes, and the professor is up at the lectern lecturing to the students, and the mm -hmm. students are in the back, and there's one of the students is asleep, and other people mm -hmm. are chatting in the background. And that, sort of the lecture and the lecture too, that was sort mm -hmm. of the model for uh, over 900 years, basically, mm -hmm. as how we, how you imparted knowledge to people in, in schools and tertiary, tertiary education. Mm -hmm. But that has changed a lot in the last few years. Uh, what's happened, uh, we've seen a tremendous growth in online learning mm -hmm. and distance learning. So for example, in the United States last year, uh, 
the largest, uh, it became the largest university, was Phoenix Online University. Mm -hmm. And I know in other parts of the world it's become very popular too, in India and Pakistan. And, uh, also I know there's a lot of advances in, in the Arab states in this area too. So suddenly people can tap into knowledge 24 hours a day. They don't have to go to a building and, mm -hmm. and get information. Um, let me give you another example. Mm -hmm. uh, MIT, you can now download uh, you know, almost 2,000 courses from, from M MIT. You can get access to the actual courseware and curricula. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a big revolution. Mm. Okay, so we're interested in the second segment of the interview to know more about the ITU Academy portal project. So first, can you tell us a brief background about how the project started and what's the status now of it? Okay, uh, well we started about, I would say, 18 months ago and, uh, and basically one of the reasons is that we needed to uh, replace our what's called a learning management system mm -hmm. uh, or, or LMS. And an LMS is really something to help you deliver online courses, distance learning courses. So we decided to go with an open source platform, which mm -hmm. is called Moodle, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's a very big open source community around that initiative. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we built some special software around that mm -hmm. uh, to uh, really facilitate creating, well, basically trying to create more of a, a learning environment. Mm -hmm. Because more and more learning, uh, you know, it, it would be a bit silly for us not to use what ICTs had to offer mm. in order to deliver good skills about mm -hmm. ICTs. So uh, we wanted to you know, use some of these new revolutions, new revolutions in e-learning, perhaps in video, uh, perhaps in uh, linking and tags, and social media, and mm -hmm. all these sorts of things. So to really facilitate the learning process. And so we do things like if you want to look up a certain topic, let's say you're looking for information that topic. We tag all these things mm. and then we show you that, oh, on this topic we're actually teaching a course on this somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to, to make relationships between different pieces of information. Mm -hmm. So sort of aggregating things together. Mm -hmm. So this platform, uh, uh, we're just, we you know, sort of officially announced here at uh, the WTDC and mm -hmm. uh, we're really working on moving content a lot of content up in this platform. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work still to go, but uh, mm -hmm. these things take a long time. Mm -hmm. But uh, we wanted to, to profit from this conference in order to make the announcement. Uh, just a question that jumped into my mind. Moving to open source platforms, was it a challenge in any way or was it an easy decision to make? Um, in this case, it was an easy decision to make. I mean, sometimes it can be a difficult uh, decision on a cost-benefit ratio. I mean, Software is actually never really free. I mean, it, it's free, but you mm -hmm. actually it takes a lot of uh, uh, work in order to support it and so on. So I think many, uh, you know, there's a lot of companies that make a very good uh, business by taking some open source software and and, and and providing customer service and support around it. Mm -hmm. And we, we still needed to have a lot of support in order to get this platform off the ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's a fair, fairly popular platform. For example, in the UK their Open Learn initiative, uh, Open University, they use this platform. They were mm -hmm. one of the early adopters. Mm -hmm. And there's many other universities and schools and institutions around the world who are using it uh, for their purposes or for in-house training and so on. It mm -hmm. allows you to track, you know, do, do people have quizzes, do people complete courses and so on. So some companies, not the ITU, they use it for things like compliance training uh -huh. that every employee has to go through a certain Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm interested to know about the content of the of the portal. So, what are the courses offered? What languages they are in, and are they for free, or not? Uh, well, we offer a lot of courses for free. It, it depends. It's either free or low cost. It okay. really depends. And we work with a lot of partners around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some cases, we're also trying to support that they become sustainable mm -hmm. as an institution, and, so, and that may require that they charge for them. Mm -hmm. But we offer a lot of courses uh, free, and sometimes they, they get oversubscribed. Mm -hmm. And because uh, even all our practically all our distance learning courses are not just you run the course by yourself; it's mm -hmm. actually instructor led. So you mm -hmm. go through various modules over s several weeks and so on. So so a course like that might take four to six weeks. It might have online chat sessions. Uh, there, there there can even be a face to face meeting at times. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but. But the, the vast majority of our courses are, are free right now. Mm -hmm. And for the languages? The languages, we uh, currently, we, uh, on the distance learning, we do English and Spanish a lot, mm -hmm. uh, some French, we do some French. 
uh, I'm, we do, we, we have a Arabic, uh, mm -hmm. cer certainly I know we have Arabic face-to-face -face courses, but uh, surprisingly in the Arab states region, a, a lot of these courses are, are run in English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for organizations or individuals who want to join the portal, uh, what are the steps that they have to do and is it uh, equally available for individuals and institutions? Or uh, Well, a lot of the information you can get off the portal or look at the old courses, because what I really insist upon is that once we run a course, we open it up so that guests can look at mm -hmm. it and use the materials. Mm -hmm. So for example, you can browse the list of courses and, uh, and then see how they were delivered and perhaps download the materials as, as you want. So we tend to open up the courses afterwards because mm -hmm. they make a great learning resource afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm interested to know about the Centers of Excellence. What are they and what services do they offer? Well, Centers of Excellence uh, is uh, basically a, a partnership that uh, part of the ITU Academy framework mm -hmm. where uh, there's about 60 institutions around the world that we partner with to deliver sort of what we say frontline training. Mm -hmm. They're close to the region, they know about the particular needs in that mm -hmm. region, and we work with them to get the top experts to, uh, to bring training to the region that's relevant to, to local needs. Mm -hmm. So for example, we have a Centers of Excellence network in, uh, in Arab states, in mm -hmm. CIS states, in, in Africa, both in French and English speaking, and also for Portuguese and, spe and Spanish speaking mm -hmm. Africa, in the Caribbean, in the Americas, and mm -hmm. Asia Pacific. I think I got them all. Okay. So in the Arab region in particular, since our audience are from Qatar, uh, what are the, the future uh, steps you're going to make in the Arab region for regarding the centers of excellence? Any specific courses or...? Well, I, I, we distributed here at this, uh, this conference uh, mm -hmm. a listing of all the, uh, the catalog of courses that we're going to be offering in, in, in 2010. Mm -hmm. But also, we, as soon as we get this information, we put it up on the IT Academy portal at academy.itu.int. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can go to the portal, choose training and events, and then choose face-to-face -face workshops or mm -hmm. distance learning workshops, and then browse through them and see. Mm -hmm. But of course, you're absolutely right. What we really need and we plan to implement is that you can navigate to courses by region. Mm -hmm. Or so by, you know, maybe you want to navigate by time and date, mm -hmm. you're, you know, or, or you want to go by Google Maps and say, mm -hmm. show me all the courses being run in this region, something like yeah. that. So we're, we're planning on doing that, but right now there already is an indication mm. where the courses are, so you know that it's, it's, it's in the region. Mm. Okay, so what are the Open uh, Educational Resources, o or OERs? What do they refer to and are they part of the portal or not? Uh, well, we're just starting with uh, Open Educational Resources. I mean, basically, Open Educational Resources are a bit like the open software movement. Mm. It basically uh, means that you can download for free course and a, or a curricula and, uh, and then either reuse it or, you know, or adapt it for, you know, or translate it into a local language or something like mm -hmm. that. And uh, some of the pioneers in this were, uh, was uh, MIT mm -hmm. uh, with their open courseware initiative. Uh, now there's about 1,800, 1,900 courses that you can freely download from MIT's uh, open courseware. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's a, it's a very, very interesting experiment. It's sort of, it was a big UNESCO Hewlett-Packard initiative. Mm -hmm. I forgot when it started exactly. Uh, but um, it's, it's something becoming more and more important. And, and it's a useful for us because if we identify a course on some esoteric s subject that was delivered, let's say, at MIT, mm -hmm. we can take that and adapt it perhaps for U ITU Academy and make sure that our membership can get access to it too. Mm -hmm. so, uh, these things are typically licensed under what's called a Creative Commons type, mm -hmm. type license. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can reuse them for non-commercial purposes, typically, and uh, which in this case, we're, you know, we don't, it's it's more for public good that we deliver these these mm -hmm. courses for the most part. Mm -hmm. So people, since they are under Creative Commons license, can educators use the material for Absolutely. after getting your consent, of course, right? Oh, no, and, and no, and, and one of the conditions, typically, if, if they want to reuse a course like this, is I actually don't have the right to assert copyright after uh -huh. it. I have to give okay. the same licensing conditions. Okay. So if I reuse the materials, you're allowed to reuse the materials, too. Okay. But, uh, All right. So what are the, train, the trainer activities that are part of the project? Well, tra trainer activities is really where we're trying to provide institutional support for people who are delivering training on, on, in ICTs. So mm -hmm. for example, I'll give you an example. We ran a training recently on Moodle, 
mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in Mozambique because mm -hmm. they want to deliver online courses in Mozambique, but they're not familiar with the, the technology. So we'll, we'll, we ran an event for Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. We're going to run the same sort of training uh, this uh, summer in Tanzania for all our African centers of excellence nodes. And uh, so it's, it's our way of really trying to assist those who are doing the direct training and, mm -hmm. and give them the expertise to, to, to leverage the tools as much as they can. Mm -hmm. Okay, my final question is the ICT Learn Conference. Yes. You uh, briefly mentioned it during your session, so please tell us more about it, the venue, the, the focus of the conference, and when will it take place? Okay, well, ICT Learn is a, is a new conference we're organizing on what is the very interesting topic of the intersection of ICTs and learning, mm -hmm. and training, and so on. And uh, as I mentioned, ICTs are fundamentally cha changing training, and we think there's a lot of potential in the future for more change. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, if you go to iTunes, you can download, go to iTunes U and download video uh, mm -hmm. courses from the, the best professors in the world. Mm -hmm. In fact, now there's some uh, professors who have almost become internet celebrities mm -hmm. because they, they are great teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, there's a very famous one of a professor, I think he's at MIT, where he teaches physics and the way he teaches physics is by swinging himself on a pendulum across the room and then and those sorts of learning experiences mm -hmm. really stick in people's minds mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of potential in the future for video learning mm -hmm. and uh, and now that we have these beautiful handheld devices and, and the iPads and stuff like that mm -hmm. and storage is getting so cheap we have the ability to have wonderful learning and training on these devices mm -hmm. and I think this is probably going to radically change the way we, we learn in the future mm -hmm. and so this is one of the topics that's going to be discussed conference will be held the 30th of November okay. through 3rd of December and it will be in a place called Busan, Korea. In okay. the Republic of Korea. And Busan is the second largest city in Korea mm -hmm. uh, right after Seoul. And it's on this very southern tip, uh, mm -hmm. although it will be November we won't be able to go to the beach. <laughs> but uh, I've been there before, it's a very, very nice place and, uh, and we're very fortunate to have uh, the Korean Communications Commission uh, uh, act as our host for this thing. Mm -hmm. Also, Busan City Council is helping us, and uh, and also the uh, Department of Broadband Communications and Development, I think DBCD in Australia, they're also providing some funding for mm -hmm. this event to, to help us bring developing countries to this conference too. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a quite interesting event, uh, mm -hmm. sort of unusual, mm -hmm. and uh, we're really looking forward to it. We look forward to it as well, and thank you so much for all your insights. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.